With Hashem's loving grace, tonight's lesson is entitled The Desert Owl, and we'll be learning Psalms 100, Psalms 101, and Psalms 102. We begin with Psalm 100. Psalm 100 is so special. Uh, it's a, I, I think maybe say it a dozen times a day. But every time, there's so many, really we should say it every moment. It's the Thanksgiving Psalm. It's a Thanksgiving Psalm, and it's a call to give thanks to, to Hashem. And when a person pays attention to all the favors that Hashem does for him or for her, you just see all the time, you just want to say thank you, you want to praise Hashem all the time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Mismola toda, mismola toda, mismola toda. That's the first two words of Psalm 100. It's a psalm of thanksgiving. Mismola toda, hariula Hashem kola A psalm of thanksgiving, call out to Hashem all the earth, all the earth. That this is what happened when Mashiach, all the earth will know that it's not the might of the right hand, that their blessing comes from Hashem. Every creation on earth will, will realize that, will fully realize that, and will have the, the spiritual awareness then of what people with Amuna have today. Now, the people with Amuna that have the spiritual awareness today, when Amuna, once Amuna comes, once Mashiach comes, that then fills the world for Amuna, like the prophet Isaiah says, then their spiritual awareness is going to be. It, I, I don't know how many times it's going to be multiplied. But one thing that we do know, our sages say that the uh, people who are strong, the people that strengthen themselves in the moon today, they're going to be the teachers of humanity after uh, Mashiach gets here. Okay, so prepare yourself. You're going to have a lot of servants doing what you're doing now, but you're not going to need to do it anymore because you're going to be teaching the moon around the world, wherever you are. Okay, uh, verse two. Serve Hashem with gladness, Come before him with joyous song. When a person is counting his blessings, it's a no-brainer. He's going to share with him with gladness because they say grateful people are never bitter, but bitter people are never grateful. So you, you serve Hashem with gladness when you thank Hashem, you thank Hashem, and you take stock in all the blessings you have in life. It's, it's automatically the verse two, that you serve Hashem with gladness and come before him with joyous song. You have a song in your heart and in your mouth, on your lips all the time. Verse 3, Something, a basic thing that everyone must know. Know that Hashem is God. That's it. Hashem is God. He made us and we're his flock. We're his sons and daughters. We're his flock and the flock of his pasture. What's Hashem's pasture? Hashem's pasture is where Hashem shows his presence, where he shows his presence. presence Hashem is present everywhere, but he only shows his presence in the holy temple in Jerusalem. Okay, everyone else, we know Hashem is everywhere. The, the, the prophet tells him, that the world is full of his glory, but he only shows his presence in the holy temple in Jerusalem. That's why we so much want the Mashiach and the rebuilding of the holy temple in Jerusalem. And verse four, do do ki Hashem kim. Who has son of Anachnu? But we said that. Okay, in verse four, uh, that we enter. Bo shall betoda chatzob siza hodlo bo shmo kitov na lechazdo v'dov do amenosoi. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his court with praise. Thank him and bless his name. In verse five, it's a short psalm. Verse five, the concluding verse five, we say kitov Hashem leolam chazdo v'dov v'dov amenosoi. For Hashem is good. His compassion is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from generation to generation. So once again, they say that all at once, and we thank Hashem for our blessings. Psalm 100. Psalm 100, no matter what mood you're in, good, bad. Psalm 100, it invokes divine blessings. And the reason is, it because of uh, that dynamics. If a person thanks Hashem, and Hashem knows the difficulties that person has in life, but yet a person thanks Hashem, then Hashem doesn't want, doesn't want you to be a liar. Hashem's going to give you reasons to thank him. Right away, it invokes blessings so that your thanks were not said in vain. Hashem will be sure to, you fill out a check and Hashem will, Hashem will fulfill it. He'll cover it. He, he, he covers the balance of any Thanksgiving check. There's another secret about Thanksgiving. When a person prays for something, there are all types of hierarchies of angels between us and between the heavenly throne that sift the fair prayers to their fingers. Is this worthy of coming to the divine throne? Is this worthy to come to the heavenly throne? A word of thanksgiving is the greatest gift that any one of us could give to the Almighty. What does the Almighty need? He doesn't need anything. It's perfect. But a gift of thanksgiving 
is something, a gift of appreciation, that's a gift of amuna. There is a spiritual law, even amongst the accusing angels, no angel is allowed to block a gift of thanksgiving because it blocks something for the king. Uh, when someone asks for a higher salary, uh, even for good health for himself or herself, or some type of amenity, they're basically asking for themselves. But when they're thanking Hashem, they're thanking Hashem, they're giving to Hashem, giving their appreciation to Hashem. It's not taking their appreciation to itself, it's giving to Hashem. So therefore, as a gift to the Almighty, no one has the right to block that. And it's a woe to the angel that tries to obstruct a prayer like that. Therefore, when you say 100, Psalm 100, before asking for any other blessing, it's like paves the road. In other words, I say Psalm 100, Hashem, I appreciate what I have, and I'd like to ask for it, da, 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 da. <laughs> and it gets it in the door, gets the prayer in the door. Okay, now continue on to Psalm 101. Psalm 101 teaches all about King David's wonderful character and his deportment, how he acts as a king. Look how national rulers, uh, how autocratic they are, and uh, ego-oriented they are, and not necessarily nice people. And David tells us how he runs his life and how he runs the kingdom. So that's Psalm 101 and verse 1. Le David mismo chesed u mishpat ashir al Hashem, ashir lacha Hashem azamera. A psalm of David, whether in times of compassion or in times of stern judgment, I will sing to you, Hashem. I sing praise. King David has his theme in several different psalms. That in the rough times and the good times, King David is not a good time Charlie. He's not a fair weather friend to Hashem. He's not a fair weather son. He thanks Hashem all the time. He's with Hashem all the time because he knows the first principle of Muna. He knows the whole. He lives his principles of Muna that everything is from Hashem and Hashem is the loving Father. Therefore, everything is for the best. So it doesn't matter what is transpiring in King David's life. Uh, he's thanking Hashem. So we say we've seen in Psalms where King David cries his heart out. We will soon see in Psalm 102, right after juxtaposed to Psalm 101, we're going to see in Psalm 102 that King David is crying his heart out. So wait a second, what do I, I, I sing to Hashem in good times, sing to him in bad times. Hashem doesn't want us to be fake. Hashem wants us to be real. Hashem wants us to be sincere. Uh, we could cry to Hashem and we can yell out to Hashem. And we can groan and moan and do whatever, but not out of ingratitude, not out of crying and complaining, out of pain. We are allowed and encouraged to share our pain with Hashem. Who are we to share it with? Only the only one that really understands us. No one understands us. And not even our, our, our spouses, our children, our fellow workers, it's so-called friends. No one understands us. Only Hashem understands. And that's why people really... Uh, are not investing in the right direction when they're cultivating all type of relationships other than the relationship with the Shem. The relationship with the Shem should be the first priority in a person's life because uh, to, to be connected with the Shem. And when a person is connected with the Shem, a person feels that loving, that, that love, even when, when a Shem apparently punishes us, apparently gives us difficulty in lives, in, in life, it's all, it's all for the best. It's all for the best. Okay, so King David in verse 2, he says, Lo asit l'neged einai, askil ad bedech tamim, matai tavo elai etalech, patob levi bekel beti. I'm attentive to the way of integrity. When will you come to me? King David knows, he says, Hashem, Hashem, I'm, I'm trying to live an upright life. And I know you cannot dwell on a place of falsehood because your name is truth, emet. Emet, that's the one. When Hashem's name is Hashem is truth, emet, is Hashem's signet ring? That's because that and one hundred percent truth. It doesn't. Is it can't be one percent. Ninety nine percent truth is one hundred percent lie. Truth cannot be altered in any way. It's not, it's not truth anymore. So King David is doing everything best to anything that is like like you purify gold, or you purify silver, you purify fine metal, you put it in a fire, and all the impurities pop out. King David does this to his soul. He purifies his soul, even with difficulties. And that should nothing be left there but truth. So I am attentive to the way of integrity. When will you come to me? When I, okay, Hashem, I'm preparing myself as a worthy vessel for the divine presence. I want you to be with me. I will act with a pure heart, even in the privacy of my home. 
In other words, what's King David saying? He's not in front of the TV cameras. He's putting on a good act and he's a distinguished and the statesman and the, the humanitarian. No, it's behind closed doors. Behind closed doors. It's, it's, it's King David often in public will take his gloves off and go to war. Okay, he does it. But it's, you see this kindness, this kindness behind closed doors. As we say, and this is far from, far from the public eye. And this is a way you could tell, like we say a person, if you want to get to know a person, person actually is a nice person. You really want to get to know a person? See the way that that person talks to their spouse. That's usually the real person because they're in their home and there's no mask. You see the way the wife talks to the husband, the husband talks to the wife. That is the real person. That is the real person. It's not they come out, they're all smiling. Everybody does that on the outside. And that's a, the plastic smile of, of Western etiquette. No, but real, real deportment is a way, it's just what King David is telling us, that in the privacy of his own home, that's where he is judged. Okay, in verse three, he says, I refuse to, I refuse to look at anything evil. I despise crooked dealings and want no part of them. Somebody comes, hey, your majesty, I got a good deal for you. And there's a nice kickback. Okay, you signed a special uh, law for us that uh, we get, uh, an, an advantage in developing a certain part of real estate, then uh, your majesty get 40% kickback and uh, get out of here. <laughs> the person it might not leave the King David's court alive. King David doesn't want any part of that. At the end part of that, nothing, no dishonesty. And this is, it doesn't, it doesn't need a, a, a court system or a police system. He's got a shem. When a person has the fear of a shem, don't need a judiciary system. In other words, look how much of crime, crime support, support society. Because of crime, there's a police system and there's lawyers and there's uh, uh, courts. And look how people, how many people, and there's jails. Look how many people make a living off of crime. So this is what Rabbi Lebi Yitzchak Berbedichev used to say. He used to say when he would invoke uh, divine compassion for the people that were there, the Jews that were downtrodden in, in Europe in the time of the Tsar. It says, look, Hashem, you've got armies, Russian armies, to prevent smuggling from Russian Poland. How many soldiers and policemen do you need on Yom Kippur to make sure that a person doesn't eat? Not a single one. Not a single one. Because they all believe in you, Hashem. When a person believes Hashem, and a person has the awe, the revere, the fear of Hashem, don't need a person. He's not going to lie. He's not going to steal. He's not going to go against the Shem's laws. And this is what King David said. And it continues on this idea in verse 4. May my heart, he's praying for himself, may my heart be devoid of perversion. Anything perverted, anything wrong, anything immoral, I shall not know evil. This is what asking the Shem. Shem, help me have an upright heart. In verse 5. I will obliterate those who defame their neighbor behind their back. You don't want to badmouth another human being in front of King David because he's not going to tolerate it. He says he's going to obliterate someone that's slandered. This is uh, this has been King David, but he he had the Chofetz Chaim written on his heart already. Okay, he had the, and the he he couldn't stand this. I can't stand a person with haughty eyes and an arrogant heart. Why, well, any person that has haughty eyes, all these highbrows, there's no such thing as a highbrow that believes in Hashem. No such thing. He believes in himself. If it's, it's all about him. It's all about himself. There's no such thing as a person with oh, haughty, a haughty brow, a high, what do you call them, highbrow? Haughty, haughty eyes. King David calls it haughty eyes. And uh, we call it in... Uh, in, in our London slang, the highbrow. Okay, that's it. Boy, Shem, it's one of the things we've picked up over the years. And, and this was exactly what King David is talking about, the highbrows here, the ones with the haughty eyes and the arrogant hearts, right here in verse 5. At verse 6, Aine, he says, okay, he does, doesn't want those haughty eyes. So where does he want his eyes? Uh, would you like to serve in King David's army in his castle? In his uh, to be one of King David's close people. So this is the uh, employment requirements. I seek the trustworthy of the land, the trustworthy people of the land to dwell with me. Okay, invited to come and work in a palace. 
He who walks the way of integrity shall serve me. Well, Hashem, you want to join the army? You want to join King David's, uh, with his, his palace staff? Okay, you can't have integrity. You have to walk the path. That's where a person passes uh, a, a, a test of truth. They're fine. He's in. And then in verse 7, Lo yishev bekerv beiti osir meya, dover shkarim lo yikon connecti. He who deals in deceit shall not dwell in my house. No, don't come for employment here. One who tells lies shall not last in my presence. In other words, King David gives them a job. One time, one time the person lies. One time the person tells something not true. Bye-bye. No severance pay. Do not collect. Go. Do not pass go. Don't collect $200. You're out. Okay, don't find a new job. Then he says in verse 8, Every morning, I'll, 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 obliterate, I'll obliterate the wicked of the land to purge the city of Hashem from all evildoers. King David was a rough judge and jury in Jerusalem because this was Hashem's city and he didn't want any evil to be in Hashem's city. So that is how King David ends Psalm 101. We now go on to Psalm 100, 102, Psalm 102, which is our feature psalm for tonight. Okay, this is a long one. The first 100 was short, was uh, five verses and 101, eight verses. And now we have 29 verses. So this is our, our feature. And our, that we'll see that the desert owl is named after this psalm. Uh, the first the first verse is something I sing all the time. I sing all the time to encourage when things are difficult, when I pray to Hashem, especially now during the wartime. And uh, I think if I had a, quite, a, quite a, a difficult day on, on Monday when I went to visit wounded soldiers. And I saw wounded soldiers from uh, Special Forces helicopter crew a rescue crew that they were in a helicopter crash. Not all of them came out alive. And I see the soldiers, it's it's so painful. And when we're little kids, the nannies, the grandmas used to have a, a uh, uh, what do they call it? A, a, a quilt, a quilting bee. They would take these patches of rags and sew them together and put padding inside, make a quilt. I don't know, was this, David, the special word like that in British English? What's the word for that? Okay, but it, 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 I think in America they used to call it a quilting bee. Sewing oh, bee. Sewing bee. A patchwork, or maybe something like that. A group, yes. Okay, could be, could be. Okay, but, um, but that anyway, that this is this is what they look like. There's a guy. He's, he's got one arm is all stitched up from wounds, and the left arm is and the legs are, are stitched up from the skin grafts and. It looks like a patchwork quilt, and that's the the one, the one that has all his limbs. Not all of them have all their limbs, and just went out of there and uh, just started singing a song. I say Hashem and that's the first verse of Psalm one hundred two. A poor man's prayer on the verge of collapse when he pours his heart out to Hashem, and just see one thing that. Let's see, uh, that would be to editorialize. But one thing that I took a lesson for myself is that, see, the way these guys, one, spoke to one airborne medic and his wife was by the bedside and it was hurting all over, sedations, you know, but he was, they, they told him I was there, he was just speaking, he was, just, he was conscious. And I can't say what his name is, but uh, let's call him Yaakov. I said, Yaakov. If you knew this was going to happen, would you do it again? He says, I'd do it again double. This is the love of these heroes for our people, for our country, for Hashem. And, and just say, and this I said to myself as I left the hospital, Soroka Hospital in Beersheba, said, this is the way you got to serve Hashem. Anything less than that is not serving Hashem. The way these heroes serve our country, this is the way you have to serve Hashem. And this is this. This is verse one of Psalm 102. A person's got a broken heart. He's got a broken heart. 
hurt all over. You see something that gives you pain all over. And that's called the poor man's prayer on the verge of collapse. Tfilala ani kiyatov. Tfilala ani. It doesn't mean necessarily financially poor, but it means that poor on the joy scale. It's not yeah, the, the joy scale. If the joy scale goes from 100, from zero to 100, on the joy scale, it's the needle is nearing empty because he sees so much pain for himself and for people that are close to him. And we look now, it is so frustrating. And you can see with the whole world, again, not enough the regular problems in life, but the whole world against us. Who did last year in simple Torah? What did we do? We wanted to dance with the Torah and have a good time. Did anybody invite terrorists to come in and to kill 1,200 people? And now with the war going up on North, who bothered Hezbollah? Who bothered Iran? Who did anything to them? Nobody did anything to them. Let us dance with the Torah. Let us learn Torah. Let us have a have a, a Shabbat meal with the, with the with the grandkids. Okay, and here they start. And now that we defend ourselves, all this kind of stuff that uh, that we've been massacre and genocide. We come massacre and genocide. This is such hypocrisy that uh, took what the USA did in Afghanistan and what they did in Iraq. There was a seven to one kill ratio between citizens and terrorists. And in Israel, as difficult as it is, two to one, two to one, that, that's not genocide. So if, they, if we're a good genocide, then the US has done it three and a half times much more. And this is, you see, the, the broken heart. It's a broken heart. That, that not that we need, that gives more of a broken heart is that people are more worried about, uh, leaders more worried about being politically correct with uh, Biden bleak and with the Shem. <laughs> it's, it, with the Shem, that, that, that is more pain. So you look around, they have enemies from the outside, enemies from within, and you feel like, you see what King David will, 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 will tell like, you see like a, a lone bird on a roof. So King David is pouring out his prayer. And as I said, the beginning of our learning of Psalms together, everything we are experiencing, King David experienced. He's been there, he's done that. So in verse one, Tfilale Anikiatov Lishne Ashem Yishpoch Sicho. A poor man's prayer on the verge of collapse. Can't doesn't feel like it could go on anymore. When he pours his heart out to Hashem. Hashem Shimaha Tfilasi, the Shavasi Alecha Tovo, verse two. Hashem, hear my prayer and let my anguish reach you. Don't turn me away. In verse three, Atahas del Panecha Mimeni. I don't Leave, don't hide your countenance from me. From the day of my distress, listen to my prayer on the day that I call you. Answer me right away. This is no time. No, this is not no formal request. That you give a, a request to the board of directors. No, Hashem, I'm in big trouble. I feel like I'm sinking. I feel like I, I can't go on anymore. And this is the way you got to talk to Hashem. This way you feel. Talk to Hashem. Tell about it. No, it's not okay. Don't be politically correct. And this plastic, uh, politically acceptable social smile. No, from the heart. Go out and talk to Hashem. Forget about that. Forget about people. Forget about the what well, we have to be with people. We have to be with people. But we have the time to be alone with the king. Take time to be alone with the king. That's what all Elul is about. Elul, when the king is in the field, Lubavitcher Rebbe told us. The king is in the field. The king is in, on, on Tishrei. In, in another week, in another week and a half, the Shem is going to be on the throne. It's not so accessible to reach the king on the throne when the mm. king is out there in the field right by you. He's in Joburg. He's out there in Idaho. He's out there in California. He's, he's, he's in Midlands up in the hills on the, the, in the sheep pasture. He's right there to speak to you where you are. Okay, talk to him right now. And so in verse 5, in, in verse 5, Look how King David's talking. For my days have gone up in smoke, and my bones are as dry as if they were burned in a furnace. So he describes his life, his whole life struggle, his whole life war, his whole life fighting enemies, his whole life and did not much. He's got enemies for within and without. His, his, his sons revolt against him. His father-in-law tries to kill him. He doesn't have such great shalom bite with his with his his, his wife Michal, <laughs> that to say the least. But, and she's punished because of that she doesn't get children because of that. And is is the closest advisors Achitopel, 
double crosses him that can't believe we're not even talking about the enemies outside the borders. This within the borders. Oh, wow. So this King David described it. said, days have gone up in smoke. What have, he, what have he done? Oh, he's done plenty. He's done plenty. But he looks at himself as if he's done nothing. And he describes himself. Look how he describes himself. The, what the King David teaches us to pour out. He says in verse 1, this is how to outpour our soul, to outpour our soul to Hashem. He says in verse 5, My heart is withered as dry grass, and I'm emaciated from not eating. Sometimes you're so, it, it's so, it's crushing sadness. It, 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 when a person, it, it crushes a person's digestive tract and can't, can't even eat, can't even eat. And when King David tried to teach something, he saw Barzillai de Gilati, he, he was on King David's table and he saw this. Uh, he went to, he went to Rajti and said, Wow, how come you don't let me eat when you're closer, when you're close, when you're close to loyal people? King David says, You don't want to see me eat. He says, But your majesty, you, you promised that you'd answer all my wishes. Barzillai de Giladi, he gave King David refuge when in the, the uh, revolt of Avshalom, King David's son, when King David was chased out of Jerusalem. And he had to go to, across the Jordan River to the land of the Gilad. And Barzillai, was Gilad, he gave King David refuge in his home. So King David said afterwards, he'll give Barzillai anything he wants. So Barzillai was an old man dying, but he had a crippled son. He says, Your Majesty, uh, I'm about to leave this world, but do loving kindness for my crippled son. So he took his crippled son back with him when he was reinstated, took him back to Jerusalem. And every day, King David would make sure that the, the palace cooks would give him wonderful food. But he said one day, was Dad, Your Majesty, I want to eat with you. Your Majesty says, no, you don't want to eat with me. And he says, yes, Your Majesty, I want to eat with you. You promised my father that uh, you'd do anything he asked. And he said, want to be in the palace. Uh, I know I have a sweet friend. I want to eat with you. King David tried to discourage him, but he insisted. He saw the way King David had his one meal. It was at 12 o'clock at night, had a small piece of dry bread. Maybe it was three-day-old bread. Three-day-old bread in Jerusalem is very dry because Jerusalem is a dry climate. It's in the Judean desert. And he had a glass of water. And the glass of water was half full. And King David made his blessing over the bread. And he ate this piece as hard as plywood, tiny little piece. And then he drank his water. Before he drank his water, he did tshuva. But he said, meal, the other do tshuva. And, and he started crying. And he cried. His tears filled up the other half of the glass. And he drank the water with his tears. Well, <laughs> Barzillai's son, he fell off the back of his chair. He couldn't see this. He did. So King David warned him. And this King David says, right here in verses 5 and verses 6, Hu shakti me. My heart is withered as dry grass, for I am emaciated from not eating. In verse 6, from the sound of my moaning, my skin clings to my bones. <laughs> he used to be very, very muscular, but now he's skinny. He's skinny. And he looks at, at verse 8, Shakati just as we said. He says, I look at myself and I've become like a lonely bird on the roof. You see, a bird, usually birds go around the flock and they chirp, they get the flock. This one lonely bird on, on a roof. And that's what King David describes himself. And then he says in verse 9, My enemies disparage me all day long. Those who deride me curse my name. In other words, they use David's name. David's name, Mashiach. They use the, all these evil, these low-life people. They use David's name as the classic curse word. You know, they say, oh, you David. That's, a, that's something that's the, the worst curse that they, they could do. They, this is what was in their lexicon. And now King David continues what we described the way he eats. And verse 10, Ki masachti. For my bread tastes like ash. This three deal old dry bread. And my drink is diluted with my tears. Right here. Description right here. Every single word. And in verse 11, Mipnei 
before I translate verse 11, I have to explain something that when Hashem gives us trials and tribulations, Hashem takes away our spiritual awareness. Because when things are difficult and we remember perfectly that Hashem is with us and that everything is for the best, then it's not a tribulation anymore. But when Hashem takes away our spiritual awareness, we just have to, all we have to rally is an Imuna. Hold on to Imuna. There's nothing else to hold on to. And Hashem takes it away. It's easy for us to see maybe that Hashem is doing something good for someone else. When Hashem is doing something uh, that's difficult for us, he takes away our, our spiritual awareness. And this is what King David says now. He's showing that his spiritual awareness is down, also low. In verse 11, Because of your fury and your wrath, Hashem, you uplifted me, but then you threw me down. And he's not complaining. He says, Hashem, okay, why did, just leave me down. Why did you uplift me? You make me king to knock me off the throne, to have my, my sons revolt against me, to have enemies from within and enemies without. Well, King David will realize when he gets when he gets back, takes a, a deep breath, he realizes that this is part of his uh, purpose in becoming Hashem's anointed king, Mashiach, and paving the way for his Sion, it's Mashiach, we hope to see him very soon. In verse 12, my days are like a lengthening shadow and I wither away like grass. He says to Hashem, Hashem, continuing like this, I, I don't know how long I can keep going. I, I just don't know. I don't know. But he says, He says, I'm like withered grass, but you, Hashem, you're enthroned forever. Your name is known from generation to generation. And now King David is trying to pick himself up. And he says a famous verse in verse 14. And you will arise to show mercy on Zion, for it is time to pardon her, for the appointed hour has come. This is a prophecy for today. It's already a Shem. We've had everything. We've had pogroms, we've had holocausts, we've had inquisitions, we've had two destroyed temples, we've been thrown to the lions and the gladiators, we've been to everything, and uh, now we've had uh, the captive in Gaza and, and bombed, and then to, and just uh, just today, everything from, from Haifa to Tel Aviv is bombed, and uh, getting a taste of what we and Ashdod have been living through for the last 13 years from Gaza, the, the last, literally the first, first time in, in years that we've had a, a little bit of a break from that. But uh, now it's happening in the north, coming from, from Hezbollah. And he says, okay, Hashem, that's the way I figured on my ledger, says King David. Uh, we've atoned for every sin. It's time to redemption. It's time for redemption. Time to take us out of exile. Time to bring us back to the land of Israel. And it's, this is in, King David is now plea bargaining. He says, it's in your interest, Hashem. Okay, why? He says, well, why do we deserve it? In verse 14, This is something, a uh, particular phrase and to heal him in Psalms that's been thrown all through history, all through the exile. For your servants have already cherished her stones. We're talking about Jerusalem. Uh, your servants, Hashem's your servants, and her is referring to Jerusalem, have cherished her stones and have been enamored her dust. People that if, they knew someone that was coming to the land of Israel. They would give them a little bag, like a little jewelry bag, and fill it up with dust. And they would fill it up with dust of the land of Israel, and they would put it under their pillow. They would sleep under there. They would sleep on the land of Israel, like Jacob. And then why, why redeem us? In verse 16, Then the nations will fear the name of Hashem. And all the kings of the earth will revere your glory. Why? Because everybody's going to see it. What we said before, that Hashem's glory will be revealed in Jerusalem for everyone to see. And this is something that's a Kiddush Hashem. It's a sanctification of Hashem's name. And everyone will see it. For Hashem will have built Zion and his glory will be apparent there. Again in verse 17, his glory will be apparent once more. We learn that outside of the Holy Temple in Jerusalem, if someone wants to see it, they can certainly see it. But if someone is not looking, even for a person that's not looking, all the nations of the world that they 
maybe even deny Hashem, but once the Holy Temple will be built in Jerusalem, everybody will see it. That they will see Hashem's glory. And this is why we want it so bad, because we don't want any more defamation of Hashem's name in the world. No, no, no more chilu Hashem. We want only to be a sanctification of Hashem's name in the world. It's not that uh, if you, you read the Rambam, uh, when Mashiach comes, it's not that we're all going to have a lot of money and uh, everything's going to be hunky dory. No, the, the difference between Mashiach, Rambam says that life is going to go on like it does today, but the difference will be that there will be no longer uh, defamation of Hashem's name in the world, only sanctification of Hashem, because it's going to be clear for everyone to see. And Muna, what now we need, and Muna to believe, we need a Muna where our eyes don't see, then not going to need a Muna because everyone's eyes are going to see. But those that have a Muna today, once again, are going to be on an even higher level once Mashiach comes. And that's what King David is, is stressing in Psalm 102. Once Hashem will have built Zion, his glory will be apparent there. In verse 18, Pana, now King David is going back. He's he's a plea bargain with Hashem. Now he's going back to his present pain. Pana el tfilat velo bazat tfilatam. He was attentive. Now King David is encouraging himself. He was attentive to the prayer of the despondent and did not spurn their prayer. David knows one thing is bad. As he feels, he encouraged himself. He says, there's no such thing that Hashem spurns the prayer of the despondent. That's the tefillalani. That's the, the poor man's prayer. The man who's emotionally poor, spiritually poor, in, in, in a, a state of emotional poverty. person doesn't feel happy. Hashem's not going to throw their prayer away. What does Hashem not accept a prayer of crying and complaining and crying and complaining, crying, complaining, let's get into the hospital and let's go to the rehab board and see people that lack one leg, one arm, some have two legs. Uh, and who visited, uh, was it, lost two legs and, and fighting for an arm. How can you complain? How can we complain? Two hands, two feet, could breathe. Or not connected to a, a a respirator. Who could complain? Who could complain? And this is why that Shem doesn't like complaining because in complaining, that's a lack of gratitude. That's the connection between Psalm one hundred and Psalm one hundred two. So it, Shem doesn't throw away the prayers of the despondent. In verse nineteen, Tikatev zot ledoacharon ve'am nivra yehalel ka. Let this be recorded for the final generation so that the reborn nation will praise Hashem. What does King David mean? Let this be recorded for the final generation. Okay, so suppose, Bezrat Hashem, that Mashiach comes tomorrow. That means that all the kids that will be born from the day after tomorrow onward, they will be have born in the Messianic era. <laughs> they won't need Emuna. They won't uh, understand what uh, mom and dad and grandma and grandpa and great grandma and great grandpa went through. So King David says, write this down to make sure they learn it. Make sure they learn what happened before there was Mashiach in the world, before there was redemption in the world. Ki yishkif mimaron kodsho Hashem yishamayim al Verse 20. For he observed from his holy heights, Hashem looked from heaven to earth. Don't think that Hashem doesn't have time to look down here on earth. Lishmoa enkat asir lefateach bnei tmuta. To hear a prisoner cry in agony to liberate those condemned to death. In verse 22, lesaper betzion shem Hashem utilato biushalayim. So if they could proclaim his name in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. And continuing with this train of thought, in verse 23, when all nations gather together and kingdoms unite to serve Hashem. And then King David is saying here in verse 24, He diminished my strength on the way and has shortened my days. Yes, Hashem, we're on the way to Geula, we're on the way to the full redemption of our people, and 
I don't know if I'm going to make it. And David is coming back now. It's like he did, he did a uh, he had a, a near death experience. He says his soul went up and he became. He, he saw that the redemption. He's praying for the redemption, and now the pain comes back, and and he's right back here. He's right back here, and he's playing with Hashem, playing with Hashem again, telling Hashem about his about his prayer. Uh, one thing that King David said. We're going to go back for a moment to verse 7. In verse 7, King David, now he's coming back. He said in verse 7, and now he's coming back here in, in verse 24. In the middle, he's making a prayer. But King David began the pain, and now he's asking Hashem he's for, 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 the, for the redemption and for seeing the redemption. Hashem, this is in your best interest. But now he comes back to his pain. In verse 20, in verse 7, he said something interesting. I am like an owl in the desert, like a barn owl among the ruins. What the, what's he mean by that? Now, they have to live in the land of Israel to understand. Where did King David live? He lived in the Judean desert. When I was in the army, I did a maneuver at night in the Judean desert. And this was a move in our unit. We had to know how to function on our own and to get from place to place on our own. And it wasn't the age of GPSs. We had maps, we had compasses, and that's how we had to function. Uh, had a topographical map and a compass. So then you Judean desert and at night, and sometimes it's weird at night because you hear coyotes and it's kind of unnerving. And sometimes there's even Judean mountain lions. They're more rare. The coyotes are, are the jackals. The jackals are very common. But I was all alone. And all of a sudden, I heard, I cry. It was like, the cry of a, a either a, a before a, 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 a young boy or a, a teenage girl, something like that was being it's as if they were being tortured. It was really unnerving. Look around, no one there. So your mind say, "Hey, what, what's this going? This, I'm I'm listening to, to to ghosts, to evil spirits in the desert. What's going on?" Well, there's an acacia tree not far, maybe about fifty meters away, and all of the, the rustling. And I saw this big, big wing that looked like a big bird. We think an owl is a small bird. A desert owl is a big bird. And an owl flew out of that tree and continued. The owl's got a voice. The owl screeches. There's the different types of owls. They're domestic owls. They're barn owls. They're owls in, in, in ruins. And the, the desert owl in the land of Israel, it yells. It's got a, it's got a yell like a person in, in distress. <laughs> and that's really scary. So I'm telling this story. This is exactly what King David meant in verse 7. Dimitri the cat made bar, I think a cos halfot. I'm like an owl of the desert, like a barn owl among the ruins. A barn owl among the ruins, he has a different kind of, of, of a whelp. It's like a whelp. And the one, but the one out in the desert, <laughs> King David has an outright yell and a, and a whelp. He's comparing himself to these two owls. So now back at verse 24, he's back in that mode. And he says, Hashem, diminish my strength, and on the way, shorten my days. And verse 25, I say, my God, don't take me away in the middle of my life. King David has still got time. It's still got time to, to serve Hashem, I know. Uh, you whose years endure throughout generations, Hashem, you're forever. Hashem, you're forever. We you got a problem. Like, give me a couple more years. Let me fulfill my, my longevity. In verse 26, In the beginning, you laid the earth's foundations, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Verse 27, They will perish, but you will endure. They will all wear out like an old garment. You will change them like clothing, and they all pass away. People like a newborn, the, the afraid garment. And now in verse 28, in verse 28 and verse 29, Fish is on a very uh, optimistic, optimistic finish. When that's the way he goes home, and he feels this way a person is supposed to feel after personal prayer, it's supposed to be a feel good. He says, Vata tamu. But you are God, your years never end. Again, he realizes uh, the eternality, the omniscience. Uh, of Hashem, Hashem all powerful, Hashem do whatever you want, whenever you want. And that's really encouraging. 
And then he says in verse 29, our concluding verse, Ki b'nei avdecha yishkonu v'zalam yefanecha yikon. The sons of your servants shall shuttle in their land and their offspring shall endure in your presence. In your presence, that means in our rebuilt holy temple in Jerusalem, speedily our days, amen, and wish everybody a signature and signed and sealed in the book of life for you and your loved ones for a wonderful new year, 5785, amen. <laughs>